Sunday School. Uh, Open the eyes of our hearts to behold wondrous things out of your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Berner Research uh, a few years ago published um, a piece uh, called Meet Those Who Love Jesus But Not the Church. And that study surveyed a, a real, really a large segment of the American population who, as the article defines them, self-identify as Christian and strongly agree that their religious faith is very important in their life, but are de-churched. That is, they were once in regular attendance in a Christian church, uh, but no longer. And now here's what's interesting about that study when they went over kind of the, the beliefs and the practices of those who uh, self-identify as, as loving Jesus but not the church. Three things really stood out in that large segment of the population. Number one, uh, there, there tends to be far less study of Scripture. They tend not to study the Bible in depth. Number two, they, they tend not to share the gospel. Um, and three, they don't worship with others. Uh, outside of, uh, you know, there's a cherry picking that occasionally will happen um, where a small group will meet, but there's no anchoring into the larger Christian community. There's no vital connection to the body of Jesus Christ in their lives. Now, that was um, so about seven years ago now, 2017. COVID didn't help those numbers, did it? Right? More people have left since COVID than have come back, right? which has prompted another book that just came out a couple of months ago called The Great Dechurching. And now that's a take, kind of a play on the expression The Great Awakening, okay? Because what they've learned from research is that if you took the, the number of people that came into the church from the first Great Awakening, add to it the number of people that came in through the second Great Awakening, and then add to that everybody who's come in from every other revival since then, and you put all those people combined, those numbers don't even come close to how many are now leaving. It's an alarming rate. The numbers and rate at which people are leaving the church is really unprecedented, as is the erosion over time of biblical Christianity in those that leave. Because if you leave the church, you're leaving the church for something else. And as we've been seeing in 1 John, there's really two categories. There's church and there's world. Okay? There's those who are aligned with God's people and opposed to God's people, aligned with God's truth, opposed to God's. You're treasuring Christ, treasuring the things of the world. And if we leave this community for a separate community over here, over time, that's going to erode the faith that was once part and parcel of those that were connected to the church. We've seen that as we've gone through 1 John. And yet so many of those who, who leave that church for the world still want to self-identify as, as loving Jesus, just not the church. This is a real thing. Tens of millions of people in the United States now identify in precisely this way. And so that, that raises the question, how should we think about that as Christians? What, what category is there for those who would say, love Jesus but not the church? Well, the Apostle John actually addresses that here in 1 John. He's going to address that directly, and he's going to help us think through that this morning here in 1 John 3. And we're going to see him do that in two ways. First, by looking at the connection that John draws between our love for the church on the one hand and our assurance of being a Christian on the other hand. So John draws a connection between our assurance of being a Christian and our love and affection and commitment to and connection with the church. But then second, we're going to look at how John defines what it means to love. I mean, it's one thing to say, I love, but it's another to understand biblically, like, what does that actually mean? If you grab 10 different people off the street and ask for a definition of love, you might get 10 different explanations. Biblically, what does it really mean 
to love God's people, to love him, to love each other, and as that pours out into our love for the world. So those two things, the connection between our assurance as Christians and our love for the church, and then what does it even mean to love the church biblically? Well, let's start with the connection then between being a Christian and loving the church. Because first of all, just, to, uh, just observe how John defines a Christian in this passage precisely with respect to the Christian's love for the church. Okay, as you go through 1 John, there's a lot of different angles that John will define Christian. Okay, he'll come at it from this angle. He'll come at it from that angle. Okay, with respect to this, with respect to that. Here in chapter 3, he's defining Christian in terms of love. And it's specifically in terms of our love for the church. So watch what he does. Verse 11, John says, For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And in the context here, the, the one another he's referring to is the church. As we'll see that as we go on. Like, look at verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death and into life. That's what it means to be a Christian, right? Right? You've passed out of death and into life. And we know that we have passed out of death and into life because we love the brothers. And as we saw last week when we talked about what it means to be a child of God, that's not just Men, it's brothers and sisters in Christ. God's children, his people, his church. Verse 19, by this, referring to everything that's come before that we're going to see this morning, by, by this love for the church, you shall know that you're of the truth and reassure your heart before him. So you see that right off the bat, we, we have the answer to the question. Can Christians love Jesus, but not the church. Is there a category, right? Well, here you've got Christians who, who love Jesus and love the church, but then there's these other Christians over here that love Jesus but don't want anything to do with the church. Is there a category for that? Biblically, do we define Christian as love Jesus but don't love the church? What would John answer to that? It's, it's a resounding no. That is not what it means to be a Christian. And, and in case that's not clear enough, unless, unless you think I'm cherry-picking this, listen to what he says in chapter 4, because he comes right back to it. He doubles down in chapter 4. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Who, whoever loves God must also love his brother. You cannot drive a wedge between loving God and loving his children. Scripture just doesn't permit us to do that. John is, is unequivocal in stating that if you are going to love God, that is going to overflow in your love for his people. And so then we can ask it another way. We can ask it like this. According to John, if you say I love Jesus but not the church, should you have Christian assurance? It's a little different way of, of articulating it. Can somebody leave the church and come back and still have been a Christian when they left? I think so. I think people can drift and then, and then come back. But if they drift, they don't ever come back. If there's this continual resentment of the church, this continual denial of the church, the, this recalcitrance, this hardening toward our hearts, against the church. Can a person like that, should a person like that have any kind of assurance that they are a Christian? And John's answer is no. Because the very evidence that they are a Christian is the presence of love for God's people. And hence the absence of love for God's people should be an indication that there's something missing here. There's something wrong with my claim to love Jesus but not his church. John says that's not how it works. There isn't a category, biblically, for loving Jesus but not his church. And yet still, just think it, tens of millions of Americans self-identify precisely in that way. And I, and I realize 
how they would respond to what John says here. Okay, it would go something like this. It would say, listen, it's not that I dislike Christians. It's just the organized church that I, just, I really don't like. Maybe you've heard that. They're um, spiritual but not religious. You sometimes hear it that way. Um, they would say they're, they're Christians. They just don't like organized religion. Okay? It's not that I have a dislike for Christians. I just really don't like the church as an institution. Now, I, just, I want to say, if, if that's you this morning, you know, we're glad that you're here, and we really do understand why people say that. There's a lot of things that we as Christians in the institutional church get wrong. We make a lot of sinful mistakes, and it's not even right to call them mistakes. Just we do bad things. Like, here we are, redeemed people, warts and all. So it's not like we never sin, right? We, we get it wrong all the time. So that explains why people might resent the church. I don't think that excuses it, though. I don't think that makes it okay. Because this is, this, is, this is what the church is, right? This is not a, a place where we are on display as trophies, right? As, as somebody has put it, this is, this is a hospital for sinners. This is where we come to reconcile when we sin against each other. This is where we come when we're broken. This is where we, we come when we, when we see our sin and we turn from it. So what do we make of that? It's not that I dislike Christians. I got a lot of Christians in my life, and I like those people. It's just the church I really don't like. Well, I think a couple things we could say in response to that, besides the fact that we understand why people would say it. But, but first of all, it's not entirely true. It's not entirely true because I, I'm, I'm telling you that the people in these surveys that leave the church, that drift, that, that de-church, they uncouple, right? They unhitch from the church, okay? It starts with, a disaffection for the institutional church, but what it ends up becoming is a disaffection for the people in the institutional church. Because if you're in the world day in and day out, and that's what's teaching you day in and day out, and that's the altar that you go to week in and week out, that becomes your worldview. And, and the things that Bible-believing Christians still believe and still identify as become antithetical to the things in the world. And so over time, there's not only an erosion of our beliefs, but there's an erosion of our love for the people who hold different beliefs. Just listen to how the secular media speaks about Bible-believing Christians. That is not, that's not loving. So I don't think it's true. Over time, really, it really becomes not just a disaffection for the church, but the people who are still in the church, okay? But even more fundamentally, that's problematic for the simple reason that biblically, Christians as a community are the church. Now, maybe you've heard that expression, I don't need to go to church because I am the church. But just think about that for a second. I don't need to be a part of a church. I don't need to go to church. I am the church. Think about the word church. The word church, as a noun, is a collective singular. Okay? Now, young people, you might not know what collective singular means, but I know you know the concept. What is a team, right? A team is a group of players that come together as a team, okay? There is one Ohio State, sorry, there is one the Ohio State University. Did I check the box right? All right? All right? That one team, though, Right, has many players on it. And not one single player can come to the mic after the game and say, I am the team. Not even Marvin Harrison. Neither can he call himself part of the team if he never practices with the team or goes to any of the games or wants anything to do with the team in any way. I mean, we, we, we totally get that when it comes to a team or when it comes to a company or an organization or a nation. And it's so different when it comes to the church. If you love Jesus, John says you're going to love the church that he loves, that he built, that he 
laid down his life to redeem to himself. And your love for his people, when you see that in your life, is going to serve as evidence of his grace working in and through you. You're loving the very thing that he loves, so much so that he gave his life for it. We know that we have passed out of death and into life because we love the brothers. We love the church. Whoever does not love abides in death. See the connection between loving Jesus and loving the church. They go hand in hand. But now we have to ask the question, what does that love entail? How does John define love here in this passage? Well, he defines it in three ways. I'm going to show you three ways here in these verses that John defines biblical love. And here's what I want to do. As we go through this passage, now I want to relate this very practically to what we just experienced this past week as a state. Really as a nation, but especially here in Ohio. And I'll explain that as we go along. But let's start with how he defines it. First of all, love is righteous. Love is righteous. And you can apply whatever synonym you like. Just, right, morally good, morally praiseworthy. Love is righteous. Look at verses 11 and 12. John says, For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So John gives an illustration here. He says, you want to you want a biblical case for this? Just go back to the first kids that came into this world. Go back to Cain and Abel, right? And already there you're beginning to see this, the, this separation of God's line and Satan's line. We saw that last week. But what we see here is love defined in terms of righteousness. You hear the connection between love and righteousness. Cain lacked love. He was full of hate because his actions were unrighteous. Vis-a-vis Abel, his brother, who was righteous. So biblical love is a righteous love. It's the first thing we've got to understand. Now, here's, here's why that's relevant to what happened in our state last week. Many people, including many professing Christians, made an argument over the past several weeks, several months, in favor of issue one, this a, a, a pro-abortion proposal, pro a lot of things actually, but the centerpiece is really abortion, okay? Many people, even professing Christians made the argument in favor of that pro-abortion issue by saying that voting yes was the loving thing to do. That was the argument. And maybe you saw some of the commercials with these so-called pastors who went on TV and said the most loving thing to do for a person considering as an, an abortion is to give them the right to do that. I've even heard some of them quote the Bible, saying, well, don't you see, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And what would be more loving than allowing that person to have an abortion? What would be more unloving than restricting that person's so-called right to an abortion? Maybe you saw the commercial. Maybe you got the mailer. Maybe in some states there were even Uh, Big billboards quoting the Bible in favor of this. Let's let let God in his word answer that. Murder, even if it occurs 
in the womb is not an expression of love in any way whatsoever. Jesus did indeed say, love your neighbor. He did not add the exception unless your neighbor happens to be in a womb. Abortion at any stage in pregnancy is not an act of love. Biblically, it is the epitome of hate and evil. There is no group of citizens in this country more vulnerable than the unborn. They cannot care for themselves. They are entirely dependent upon us to protect them. And so to literally slaughter them in the womb in the name of love is the epitome of hate and evil. And I've seen the exit polling. A very large percentage of professing Christians here in Ohio voted to enshrine that hate in our state constitution. Christians voted for this. Professing Christians And I can tell you that these were not members of Bible-believing churches believing this word. Many were part of the very group that claims to love Jesus, but not his church. If we're going to truly love someone, it must be a righteous love. Otherwise, it is not love at all. Which raises the question, though, doesn't it? How do we know what is and what isn't righteous love? Or put it another way, by what standard do we know what is righteous? When it comes to this issue or any other. But especially this issue, because this has been in the news lately. And if you've been listening to the news, you heard the pundits and the politicians and many, many, many citizens in our state give the standard. The standard by which we know what is morally right and what is morally wrong is, ready, popular vote. Don't you see the people have spoken, and so it must be right. Although I can guarantee you if the vote had gone the other way, the argument would have been, how could all of these people have gotten it wrong? Okay, because the narrative of the media is not pro-Christ. It just isn't. We need to say that. But the standard that we were given this week in all different kinds of areas was popular vote determines right from wrong. And that's just not how morality works, folks. It does not work that way. We don't take a poll in order to determine right from wrong. It is not determined by a majority vote. It is not determined by legislative policy. It is not determined by executive decisions. It is not determined by judicial rulings. The popular vote doesn't determine what's right and wrong. As a matter of fact, a majority can get it wrong on moral issues. And if you're talking with somebody who doesn't believe that, just remind them that it wasn't that long ago in our country that the majority vote would have been in favor of chattel slavery. A majority can be entirely wrong on moral issues. And so that cannot be the standard by which we know right from wrong. Well, then what is the standard? Moral relativism can't provide that standard. We need an objective standard. We need a universal, unchanging standard that's not going to shift from election to election or from generation to generation. If something is morally right or morally wrong, it's morally right or morally wrong regardless of how many people think otherwise. We need something objective, universal, and unchanging as our standard. And the only place you're going to find that coherently is in Christianity. Because it is only Christianity that offers us an absolute, universal, unchanging, righteous God who has revealed his character to us as the standard. He's revealed it to us. He's made it known. He's told us what accords with his righteousness in his word. But more than that, he's not just revealed it to us. He entered into this world. 
and he kept the moral standard. In the greatest act of love that this world has ever seen. More on that in a moment, so pin that. Love, if it's to be love, it's got to be righteous. These last two will go quicker. Second, love must be tangible. Biblical love must be tangible. Look at verses 17 and 18. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is it doesn't. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Biblical love is expressed tangibly as we meet the needs of others. Biblical love doesn't give lip service to the needs of other people. Biblical love meets the needs of others. Now let's turn it to ourselves now. Let's look in the mirror. This is something I think in particular Bible-believing conservative Christians really need to hear. Because we get this wrong. We get, the, we get the balance often wrong on verse 18. Let me just use issue one from last week as an example. All right? When it comes to loving people in truth, when it comes to loving people in truth regarding abortion, conservative Christians are, are, are generally ready and eager to love with the truth. Right? We know how to give good reasons for why people inside the womb are just as valuable as people outside the womb. We understand the arguments from the other side, and we know how to respond to those. We know how to answer that with truth. We're ready, we're eager to love in truth, but then when it comes to loving people in deed regarding abortion, we're a little less ready. Not quite as eager. In fact, we often don't even know what that would even look like. Except for perhaps sending a check to a pregnancy resource center. So let me speak to my fellow conservative Christians when I say we should own our sin as regards this issue. What, what, if, what if Ohio was the leading state of the nation at providing alternatives to the choice of abortion? What if all the arguments that were out there about how if we don't give the option of abortion, here's what's going to happen to this family, and we had answered that argument with deed? What if we were the, the, the number one state of Christians adopting and fostering children that people didn't want, of supporting families in crisis? What would that have done, perhaps, to how the nation voted? Or even our state voted. We can't do half of verse 18 and call that love. Right? Look at, look at verse 18. Simply preaching the truth is not enough. Do you hear that? And I believe in preaching the truth. Like, this is the centerpiece of what we do. God's truth is what changes hearts. But look at this. He says, simply preaching the truth is not enough to constitute biblical love. In order to be biblical love, it must be accompanied by tangible acts of meeting the needs of others. And so like in terms of issue one, right? This would be loving the young mother considering an abortion. By, yes, telling her the truth about the image of God in her womb and the value of that child and the reality of of who that child is as a person, but also providing her, providing her with the world's goods. Literally, that's, that's the word there is bios, life, that she needs, that she doesn't have if she's going to bring this child into the world. You have to feed that child and care for that child. She might not know how. She might not have a, a family or community around her to, to help her with those things. We have to be ready, and that would be financially. That would be pastorally. That would be educationally. It would be relationally. It would be loving indeed. It may even mean that more Christians in Ohio are willing, 
to foster and adopt the children that would otherwise be destroyed in the womb. It means loving not in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. So I, I, I want to encourage us as a congregation that over the past year or so, like we, we've really, I think, in many ways come together to try to do that. And praise God for that. There's been many ways and many opportunities where we have tried to answer, that we have tried to be pro-life tangibly to people in this church and in this community. But this needs to be the standard of love by which the entire Christian church in Ohio and our nation and the world needs to have. Loving in truth, yes, but also loving in grace. Grace that is tangible, that delights to meet the needs of others. That should be the distinguishing mark of the Christian church. Here's how Jesus put it. John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love is righteous. Love is tangible. And then lastly, it is gospel-centered to the core. Verse 16. By this, we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. You see, in, in the truest sense, the final referent for defining love is a person, is Jesus. As I said earlier, he's not only the righteous God whose very unchanging character is the standard of righteousness, right? He is the righteous God who entered this world and kept that righteous standard for unrighteous sinners like us. There's not another worldview that has anything like this. There's no other God out there. There's no other prophet out there who enters this world to die for unrighteous people. That's love. That is gospel-centered love. That is the gospel. It's ultimately, that's how we know what love is. By knowing love incarnate, who came out of love to lay down his life for us on the cross. Here's how Jesus put it in John 15. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Let me ask you this. How does that speak to issue one? How does the gospel-centeredness of love help us understand what has gone on in the past week and where we are now as a state of Ohio? Well, first of all, it reminds us that Jesus gave his life for sinners. This undercuts any self-righteousness for any of us in here in this room. Because we're the, we're the sinners that he came to die for. Okay, we're, he came to die for sinners who fail to love like he does, just like us. But let me tell you what, Jesus also came to die for murderers as well. Do you remember? He was in between two murderers on the cross. And the one that turned to him and received him by faith was with him that very day in paradise. Jesus dies for people who get it wrong on abortion. For everyone who, who turns from their sin in repentance and turns to him. That's, that's the whole reason Jesus came. Abortion is not the unpardonable sin, and we ought not to talk about it like that. We need Christ's blood to forgive us just as much as anybody else. And his grace is what changes the hearts of every sinner who turns to him. 
We need to offer that hope. Verse 16 is a reminder that our culture needs to hear from us not only the truth of life in the womb, but also the truth of grace in the cross. That's what it means to love in a gospel-centered way. But then lastly, I think verse 16 reminds us that the chief way we as a church are called to pursue the abolition of this horrid practice in our country is not with political might, but with gospel advance. So let me just say loud and clear, we can and we should do what we can at the ballot box. And many of us did that this week, but if last week taught us anything, it's that the ballot box can't change hearts. Do you understand that? Ballot boxes, policies, politicians cannot change hearts. Only the gospel can do that. And it is only as hearts are changed by the gospel that the ballot boxes are going to make any difference for the unborn. Look, when professing Christians are voting yes on issue one, we've got to have heart change. If we truly want to see abortion end in our state, we have to do that with the gospel one household at a time. It's only when people understand and treasure the great cost it was for Jesus to love us that they are going to be willing to love others at great cost to themselves, including the cost of loving the unborn. You know, I was, like probably many of you, pretty discouraged this past week as I pulled up on the Internet. You know, they have the, the map, the voting map. It goes by, by county, and it shows you the percentage of votes. Like, I was pretty discouraged when I saw all of the counties voting yes on issue one. But the Lord reminded me as I was looking at that, not to, not to just be discouraged as if I have no hope. Because you know what? Jesus was king on Monday. Jesus was king on Wednesday. Jesus is still king today. He did not lose control of the wheel in heaven. He is sovereign over every election. Jesus is king, not the 55% or whatever it was of people in our state who voted yes on issue one. Jesus is king, not the politicians. Jesus is king, not our nation collectively. Jesus is king over every nation. His sovereignty is unquestionable. It is unwavering. Jesus is king. And it's because Jesus is king that we need to look at that voting map from the perspective of his kingship. I'm, I'm the chair of our mission committee as a presbytery, helping our presbytery plant churches in Ohio. And you know what I see when I look at that map? I see a blueprint for planting new churches in Ohio. I now have a map telling me precisely where we need to go and take the gospel to plant churches. I have a map now that tells me where in the power and in the authority of Jesus Christ, we as a church are now going to go to advance the good news of Jesus Christ that can change hearts and can have an impact statewide, nationwide, worldwide. That is, that is the love that we need for one another as a church. It's certainly the love that we need for the world as, as our love for each other overflows in our love for people who have either left the church and not come back or have never been a part of it to begin with. You want to see things change? Advance the one thing that can effect it. And that's the gospel. Which is a good place, I think, to close this morning. Because tied up in all of this isn't just things going on out there. You understand John's writing this so that we understand things going on in here. He's giving us 
the means of assurance that we are Christians. And as we, as we look and we see in our hearts, in our affections, in our actions, a genuine love, not just for Jesus, but for his church, you understand we grow in our assurance, as he says here in this passage, that our love is evidence that God's love is abiding in us. And the, the wonderful truth of the gospel is, as we cultivate that in our own lives, in our families, in our church, that's going to spill over into our world as King Jesus goes and gets those for whom he died. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Let's pray for more love. Jesus, this is a mark of what it means to be a Christian, that we love you, we love those who you've united to yourself and to us in the gospel, and that that love pours out into a love for the world that doesn't know you. And Father, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we would abound in love. And that this would have an effect not just in the church, but in our nation. For the glory of King Jesus, we pray. Amen.